so I'll begin. So the first thing I'll do is to write down the total action for the in gauge theory that we had found. Okay, and I'll first consider the case of pure gauge theory, which means only gauge fields and no form ones or scalars. Okay, and then we'll see how to incorporate form ones and scalars. So total action. So the action was given as follows with so an integral d4x. So first we have the gauge kinetic term, and I'll write down now in the explicit expansion. So we are using summation convention, so repeated in the automatically sum. So this was the gauge invariant part of the action. Then we have a gauge fixing term, which is minus 1 over 2 alpha. Then you have the ghost kinetic term. And then you have the ghost interaction term. For the gauge indices, it doesn't matter whether I write the index up or down. Okay, we are not we are not distinguishing between upper index and lower index. So this is the total action with which you have to work. But when you calculate, for example, S matrix element or all the operators, you only look for operators which are made of the AMUs, and in that also you restrict to gauge invariant operators. Okay, because this is inherited from an original gauge invariant theory, and in order to go from the original formulation to this formulation in terms of ghosts and gauge fixing terms, we have seen that this equivalence between these two work only for gauge invariant operators. Okay, otherwise, it's not the same as original theory. If someone has given me this, this action, you're yes. mentioning that it comes from some gauge theory. Mm -hmm. One would have likely taken this DC in the external lines as well. Yes, exactly. But does the screen statistics term ensure that their scattering cross section is always be zero? No. So not necessarily. If you take the VC in the external lines, you will get all kinds of uh, nonsensical results which will vary various axioms of quantum uh, theory, of uh, quantum field theories, okay. including, for example, it will not give a unitary amplitude. Yeah. Okay. So, but if we want to uh, know why VC cannot appear in the external state from this formalism, okay. one has to uh, use what I mentioned yesterday that VRST invariance. So once you understand BRST symmetry of this, right, then the BRST symmetry itself gives you a procedure for determining which external states are allowed or which are not allowed. Yeah, so that's the way you can rule out BC in the external state. But at this level, if I just give you this action, then you will in principle calculate everything. Well, I have not even introduced QB. We have mean, to wait till. Yeah. So, no, uh, we will see what the, cor the, uh, the correspondence is, right? How you have to use BRST symmetry, right? 
and then we'll, we'll see how it comes about here. So right now, we are just working with this action and we have to keep in mind that this action is derived from the original gauge, gauge invariant theory. And so the only things which are sensibly calculated using this action are expectation values of gauge invariant operators. Okay? So now what we are going to do is to use this action to derive the Feynman rules of this theory. Okay? So Feynman rules in this case will involve first of all finding the propagators. So there are two sets of fields. One is the gauge field. We have to find the propagator for the gauge field. And then there's a ghost, EC system. So you have to find the propagator for the ghost. And then we'll under try to understand the interaction. So we start from the gauge field kinetic term. So this comes from two sources. One is that you pick these terms. Dynamic term is quadratic in M. So you multiply this with this. And that gives you term quadratic in M. And then this also has a term quadratic in M. So these are the two sources of kinetic terms. So you have to combine them. Now to combine this with this, we can see that because the second one is already anti-symmetrized in mu nu. We can just drop the anti-symmetrization in the first term and multiply the result by two. Is that clear? We are taking the sum product of this and this. This is already anti-symmetrized in mu nu. So you can just forget about the this minus sign and replace the minus one foot by minus half. So this gives you integral d four x minus half L mu L mu A L mu L mu plus half Is this okay? I multiply this with this and this with this. The second term has a minus sign, so that made it plus half. And then you have something from here, minus one over two alpha. I'll now rewrite this in a different way. So I'll integrate by parts to put all the derivatives on the second one. The first one will be minus half a mu box plus half. Second one. In fact, second and third, you can see they are the same. So you have basically one minus one over alpha. And here you have a a nu. So is one plus alpha? One plus? Yeah, because the division by parts of that. In front of this. Yeah. In front of this. Yeah. The whole thing. Oh, it's one plus sign. Yeah. No, not one plus. Because this has a minus sign, right? Yeah. I integrate the parts and become plus. Yeah. So it's minus times minus become plus. This is okay? So now to calculate the propagator, I have to write in a moment of space. So in the momentum space, this has a form d4k, 4 d4, outside. Now let me write this follows.
Ito yung mga like M M How you get mu and nu in one of the terms? Right? So this one a mu, a nu, right? Because del mu del nu is totally symmetric in mu nu. Right? It doesn't matter for that to put the mu on this side or that side. Okay, the general structure is that it's mu and nu are carried by a, okay, and the two derivatives are carried by u, also carry mu and nu. Right? That's the structure of the second term. The first term is there's a box and the indices of a get short term. Is this okay or should I do it more? Just exchange, see here, when I put it on the other side, I already got a nu, del nu, del nu, a right? Here, when you put it on the other side, I had a nu first and nu here. But nu and nu are of course completely symmetric, right? So I just exchange nu and nu, wrote it as nu and nu. Okay, so here you have minus a squared, Plus one minus one over alpha. Is this okay? I replace box by minus k square. Okay, because every derivative is i k mu and this one I replace by i k mu times i k mu so that's minus k mu k mu that meant this plus. From this, we can read out the gauge field propagator. So, first of all, let's say how will it denote the gauge field propagator. So, here is our index mu a, mu b. So, the notation for this is that this is. P1, this is P2. This is the expected value of A, A nu, P1, A, A nu, K2. Okay, because K1 always enters the box, right? That's the convention you have been using. So K1 should be going in this direction, K2 should be going in this direction. If we recall the expression for that, by following the same uh, procedure we had done for general A maybe, right? We had an MKL, if you remember, right? then we wrote down the propagator in terms of inverse. So this should be given by M inverse, MK1 inverse. In this case, it doesn't matter whether it's K1 or K2, but in general, it's by MK2 inverse, or MK1 inverse. Let me
times Compare this this form <coughs> that I have here, used here with the general form that I wrote down. Okay, in well, pi k and pi l, if you remember the uh, general mosaic case. Once the binary mm -hmm. term has this form, the propagator is given by this. Okay, in this case, it doesn't matter very much why you put the indices a, b, or mu nu because everything is symmetric. Okay, but it's good to keep in mind in general, right? In cases, in case where you don't get a symmetric yeah. matrix, where the indices go. Okay, and this is the way the indices are supposed to go if you look in the old form. Pardon? Yeah. Two by the four times. I times two. And as we had discussed earlier, it's for most use, is just best to just drop these factors and least restore it at the end in terms of overall momentum conserving delta function. Right? So you drop these functions from the vortices as well as from the propagators. Okay, so I have written it here, but from now on I will try to drop these factors from the expression for the propagator and vortices. Okay, but we have to calculate this. Mk inverse, okay, where Mk is given by this. So, one way to calculate this, there are different ways to calculate it. You can go to a specific frame and try to directly invert the matrix. Okay. But the one way to calculate this is to write down the most general form that is possible for Mk okay. consistent with Lorentz matrix. And of course, in the AB space, we know that it has to be proportional to delta AB, right? Because identity in the uh, gate space, so its inverse is also identity. So we use the answer that Mk inverse AB is given by delta AB and then we say A of k beta mu nu plus E of K is the K <coughs> Okay, this is the most general Lorentz invariant, uh, Lorentz covariant form that you can write down. And now the idea is that we will determine this coefficients A and B by requiring that M, A, M inverse times same becomes identity. this here. So let's calculate Mk inverse A mu, B mu and then say Mk you want to calculate B mu B rho say. So you expect this to be delta AC delta AC and then delta mu rho. But when you put these expressions explicitly, we get delta AB times A beta mu nu plus B K mu K nu times what we have here minus k square beta mu beta mu nu, so you need Is it delta? Yes, delta, let's put the delta also. Delta bc we have minus k square beta mu rho plus <coughs> 1 minus 1 over alpha 
purely here. Okay, so all we have to do now is to multiply it and see what we get. So we get the delta AC. Let's go to the next slide. Let's go to the next slide. For gauge index, I have an saying it doesn't matter whether the index is up or down. So delta AC. So first you get minus A times K square times theta nu rho. Delta nu rho. Then you have this times this minus b k square d nu k rho. And then you have a times this plus a times 1 minus 1 over alpha. Again, k nu k rho. And then finally, we have this times this plus, plus b times 1 minus 1 over alpha. Now, k mu with k mu gives you k squared. So, k squared. Is this okay? So now we have to equate this to one because that's what we want, and then the rest of the coefficients to zero. So this gives you minus a k square to one. So a minus 1 over k square and then the other equation tells us is it b k square b k square okay, let's put everything on the other side so 1 minus 1 plus 1 over alpha is equal to a times 1 minus 1 over alpha so b all over k square times alpha minus 1 times k. So with this, we can now write the <coughs> propagator. Mk inverse nu b mu. So Mk inverse in a new in a new is delta A B. Minus one over K square. Taken the b on the other side, keeping the no, a on. No, no, no. Putting a equals to minus one. I mean, if you put a equals to minus one, you get the same. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'll take minus one over k square outside, and then eta nu rho nu mu minus. Ok, 
say this is minus, so this I can write minus 1 over A square and 1 minus alpha times A. So A, once you have taken the A out, A form is out, that is the minus 1 over K square. We have eta nu mu, that is the coefficient of the eta nu mu part, okay, A you have taken out. And then from B, again I have taken A out, so it is minus 1 over K square times 1 minus alpha times K. So that is our gauge field property. Okay. And you can see that it depends on the choice of alpha. special choices of alpha which are often used. Okay, so alpha equal to 1, this is called Feynman gauge. Okay. If you set alpha equal to 1, then this term goes away. And the propagator becomes i minus i j square inverse. Okay, minus i, this i comes from this i over here. There should be a plus sign. Eta mu plus eta mu. Eta mu which should be plus sign? No, see the point is there is an a here, right? Yeah. Achha, achha. So I have taken the a outside. That, that is minus 1 over k square, right? So now you have there's a minus 1 over k yeah. square times 1 minus. Why? Oh, the i is this i, which is somewhat hidden there, which you don't. I mean, the propagator has i times m inverse, right? Eh? So this i is what is appearing like there. Okay. Are there other questions? Okay, yeah, thank you. So the other choice which is often used is the alpha equal to 0, this is for Landau gauge. Okay. In this case, it's a little more complicated. The propagator is i minus k square inverse delta ab and then eta mu nu minus k square inverse. Alpha, that is the gauge choice is coming because anyway, anyway, not gauge. Exactly. Right? I mean, you can easily check that when you try to calculate the f mu nu f sigma using this propagator. Right? That's the next exercise I'll give. to calculate f mu nu one okay here the tilde just means Fourier transform okay not uh, no, duality or so, dual or anything just Fourier transform if you calculate this okay. using the mu nu two point function that we uh, gave okay. that this first of all is alpha independent and that it agrees with earlier result for QED. Okay, this is was part of the homework problem, right? You remember in QED we had Another way of uh, uh, evaluating this, which is to basically remove one of the modes, right, and then uh, carry out passing integral over the three modes, okay, in which case the propagator is invertible. 
but this will have the same value. Okay? Because after all, you are calculating the same quantity. Okay? We did it one way there. We are doing it in another way here. The fact that it's non abelian gate symmetry, it plays no role as far as the kinetic term is concerned. Okay? Because the kinetic term is still f mu nu. So I'm going to come back to this in a few minutes later. Yes. Initially we are defining one by two, one, one over two by alpha. That that it is ill defined. Yes. So you can think of this as alpha goes to zero limit. If you want also see what that alpha going to zero limit does to the expression that I had. If alpha entered because I wrote this e to the i over 2 alpha B A B A, right? That's where it came from. And that gave uh, gave this to the I over 2 alpha H H after you do the B A H itself. Right? Because there's a delta function. So they are taking alpha goes to zero limit, means that it becomes a Gaussian which is more and more sharply peaked around H A equal to zero, right? Because it is a, I wrote it to the I over 2 alpha, but there's also an epsilon. Okay? So it's really minus I times 1 plus i epsilon over uh, 2 alpha, then to the minus epsilon over 2 alpha, which is a damping factor, okay, that becomes more and more sharply picked in the alpha goes to 0 limit. So it becomes a delta function. Okay. So alpha goes to 0 limit is equivalent to having the original uh, uh, delta function form, okay, in which you are actually just inserted delta of h a minus a, a. If you had inserted just delta of h a, okay, setting a equal to 0, okay, that's equivalent to setting the alpha goes to 0 limit. Okay, but this result, of course, should be valid for general alpha. Right? All physical quantities should be independent of alpha. <coughs> so the idea is that you can use this freedom to vary alpha. So for some purpose, it may be useful to use one value of alpha. Right? For some other purpose, it may be useful to use another value of alpha. But since you know that for physical quantities, the value of alpha uh, makes no difference, you can use different alphas to prove different uh, properties of it. <clears throat> what you have to remember is that when you are calculating an amplitude by summing over Feynman graphs, okay, you must use the same alpha for all Feynman graphs. Right? Because it's only a sum over Feynman graph that has the property that it's independent of a choice of gauge. Okay, so you must not change your choice of gauge okay, while cal calculating Feynman graphs. So next we consider the ghost propagator. So here, our ghost kinetic term. We start with the ghost kinetic term, which will eventually lead to ghost propagator. Okay. So this is the integral d four x. So the ghost propagator will give the dotted line but the ghost propagator 
has different ends or host propagators represent different things. Right? One end is B, the other one is C. Okay? That's like psi and psi bar that we had for part bars. Okay. So you have to specify somehow that which end is B, which end is C. Okay? And we'll use the convention, this is again purely a matter of convention, that the B end is will put an arrow. And the arrow comes out of the B end and goes towards the C end. Okay, that will be a convention we'll be using. Okay. So we'll draw an arrow here. Okay. So this end will be B. Well, let me put let me put the C on this side. So this end will be B. This end will be C tilde. Okay. So this carries the index A. This carries the index B. We can say this is K1, this is K2, and the propagator will be I times minus 1 over K square times So one thing you should, you can notice is that there is no half here. Right? Unlike in the scalar fields or the gauge fields where you had a half, here there is no half. Okay. And this is because the two ends are different. Okay, This is exactly like psi bar psi that we had. Okay. In the case of psi bar psi, okay, we didn't have a half in front of the action. Nevertheless, the propagator had this structure. There was an extra half in the propagator. And that has to do with the fact that when you take derivatives with respect to this delta delta j, okay. when the two ends are the same, you get extra factor of two. Okay. The half compensates basically for the extra factor of two. That's not there yet. So this represents this expectation value. C tilde A, C tilde C tilde B. This is C tilde B. Again, if we exchange this, you give a minus sign. Okay? So then you may wonder which one is correct. Right? So that this is the correct one or the other way is the correct one. That those two differ by a sign. Okay? And you can fix the sign by following exactly the same procedure we use for formulas. Okay? There, the action had psi bar psi. If you remember, so P is playing the role of psi bar, C is playing the role of psi. Okay, psi bar psi. Okay? But the propagator represents the psi psi bar. Uh, uh, Two-point function, right? Psi came first, psi bar came second. That's the analog that the C comes first, B comes second. Okay, we can show that with this definition of the propagator, okay, there is an extra minus sign over here. Okay. So the calculation is exactly identical. We insert the corresponding currents, okay, that couple to B and C, just like we insert inserted the J's. Okay. Then carry out the path integral, okay, evaluate this two-point function, and you will find that this is the result. The result for this is given by this times, of course, the two point two be four delta k on plus k two, which you have not written. K square should be either k one or k. Yes, this should be k on k. In this case, it doesn't matter. So this is important because if we have a Feynman diagram with lots of ghost vortices, for example, right? And you have those vortices and you have to connect them by propagators. Okay. Which sign that Feynman diagram carries will again be determined by that same contraction rules. Right? You contract the C's and B's in this case instead of psi and psi bar. Okay. And how many times it intersects? those lines will determine whether the amplitude has positive sign or negative sign. Where is the K2 contribution going? I mean, uh, oh, there is a hidden factor which I didn't write down, right? 2.2 to the 4, delta 4, K1 plus K2. Okay? This factor I just 
keep dropping. Okay, so this basically says k1 equal to minus k2. Okay, so now then we'll turn to the interaction processes. Okay, because those are the second ingredient of calculating a final. So in lambda gauge, that will be K1 then. In lambda gauge? I mean, the propagator of. See, the host. No, not here. Same. Yes, this will be all. Uh, here I just, just wrote K because I didn't. Specify K or K two. See, whenever we drop that delta function, delta function right? Okay. Then I label this in this way that we have a K momentum so in, in some direction, okay. and then you have some A new and B new, right? We had something like A new B new. Okay, this is the way I write the propagator. Okay, because I don't now I don't write separately K one or K two. <coughs> Right? I just have to write k, then k1 will be either k or minus k, depends on which end is representing k1. Okay? So this is the standard notation for the propagator that one uses if we drop that 2 pi to the 4 delta function term. Okay? Then it's just written this way. Is this point here? Right? So whether it's k1 or k2, okay, this k will determine. Yeah, if you follow the derivation, right, it's clear that the ghost propagator doesn't depend on alpha, right? Because the ghost propagator was a determinant, right, which didn't depend on B. See, the return, because B was just a constant added to HA, right? H, it's a delta of HA minus B. So the determinant didn't depend on B, right? And alpha interacts through B integrals. Okay? That's the reason the ghost propagator doesn't, doesn't depend on alpha. Even the ghost interactions also do not depend on alpha. Okay? So the alpha dependence must cancel among themselves with the gauge piece, right? The ghosts are not going to help you in cancelling the alpha dependence. Right? But if you change H itself, right? Suppose from the del mu A mu equal to zero type gauge, right? You go to some other gauge, say you said A zero equal to zero. Then the ghost part will change. Yeah. Okay, but the alpha dependence cancels by itself. Is this clear? Since we have initially taken all the BS to be zero. All the? BS to be zero. So the most important factor to take is the AK. I mean, what functions you are taking, right? Yes. So you can set it to any value. That will just tell you what kind of curve. I mean, That's the right, value yes. of it. Yes. So uh, if you set the BS equal to zero in the first place, yes. then you wouldn't have been able to do this. Yeah. Well, the point is BS were introduced so that I keep one constant freedom and I average over it. Yeah. Right? So if you set the b to be zero from the beginning, then you have a delta function. Right? Yeah. For certain choice of ages, you can explicitly solve. For example, a zero equal to zero gauge. Yeah. Suppose you want to choose a zero equal to zero gauge, right? Then that means on, from all your expressions, you just drop a zero. Okay. Which you could do easily. But suppose you want to choose del mu a mu equal to zero. Right? Then you, it's not easy to write down explicit solutions of that. Okay. In terms of three uh, variables. You can in principle do it, but it's just cumbersome. Okay. So to avoid those situations, you give this B freedom, yeah. okay. so that in gauges of the form where it's not easy to eliminate, okay, you can use that B, okay, averaging over B, to write it as a term in the action. Okay. Then you don't worry about eliminating any variable, you integrate over all variables. Okay. But the fact that you have that extra term in the action is equivalent to what you are doing right. Okay, so the B is just a trick that we use, okay, so that eventually you can average. Is this okay? Any other question? Okay, so now interaction.
first A A A. So these come from each term in this f mu nu f mu nu, right? There is a linear term and then the quadratic piece. Okay. So to take the product of the linear part and the quadratic part, okay, that gives you a triple A okay. so That's the origin of this triple A thing. Now there is a minus one for one quarter sitting outside. Remember. There is a factor of 2 which comes from the fact that it's like a plus b multiplying a plus b. Right? So the a b cross term comes twice. Right? First term of the first one times second term of last term of the last one and vice versa. So that gives a factor of 2 which we will not worry about. There is another factor of 2 that you can get if you Drop the anti symmetrization in del mu a nu minus del mu a mu. Okay. You can just pick del mu a nu term because the term that you are multiplying it with is already anti symmetric in mu a nu. So you can check that, right? Because it's, let me write this, then it will become clear del mu a nu a. So let me write times 2. So del mu a a nu times g. A, B, C, A, A, B, E, A, B, U, A, B, E. Okay, this was the, this is the kind of term you are going to get. Okay. But this one you can see, this is a totally anti-symmetric in under A, A, D, E, okay? F, A, D, E. So, in particular, if you exchange D and E, that's equivalent to exchanging mu and mu. <coughs> if you exchange D and E and at the same time mu and mu, okay, it has exactly the same structure. Is this clear? So what I'm trying to say is that it's <coughs> this expression is anti-symmetric in under mu nu. Okay? Because if you exchange mu and mu, you can bring it into the original form, but also extending, re-leveling D and E, but when you re-level D and D, this picks up a minus sign. Okay. So because of this, the other term, minus del nu A mu that we had, okay, that we are dropping, and you are multiplying by some other factor. Okay, so this is the structure of the term. And then you have integral before x. Now we write in the momentum space. So minus g times f a d e integral d four t on derivatives of i k1, i k1, you see what I have done here, that I wrote this as rho, a e rho, okay, and contracted by it an rho, okay, that's why this, here the three indices are 
argument uh, defining this one. Okay. And then I replace this del del x mu, which is acting on the first one, okay, by i k one. That's like. Yes. So I'm just writing the interaction term. When you write the vortex, there will be an overall factor of i, right? Because that comes from e to the i s. Yes. Is this okay? So now the idea is that then you can of course work with this vortex, but this quantity, see this object over here. All of these are A fields. Okay. So there should be a symmetry under ADE exchange, arbitrary exchange of arbitrary permutations of ADE simultaneously with mu, mu rho and k1 takes place. Okay. You don't have to. At this level, it doesn't matter whether you symmetrize or not. Because you actually write down the Feynman diagrams, right? You either have to symmetrize the vortex, right? Or you have to keep track of you have to think of this as a different vortices, right? In one of them, k1 comes from something, eta neuro comes from something, and so on, right? There are, there are different uh, uh, kinds of vortices. So what we can do is that we replace this by one sixth times this with all possible symmetrization. One sixth because permutation of three objects. Permutation of three things, mm -hmm. right? So there are six factorial, three. not just cyclic permutation, so sorry, three factorial. Mm -hmm. That's six. Right? That's why it's one six times a sum of six terms. Is that okay? You don't have to worry about it as just scalar, right? And if just scalar, yes. then if pi one pi two pi three, then it will well, the then, then I, I mean, what, if there are scalars, you can either, if you keep track of which one is phi 1, which one is phi 2, which one is phi 3, then they're different anyway, you don't have to worry about this. Yeah. But if you want to write it as phi i, phi j, phi k, yeah. times some v i j k, right? then that v i j k, you, it's easier to symmetrize, right? Yeah. It's a question of whether you are calculating, the drawing or Feynman diagrams in terms of each individual field, oh. or whether you are drawing it in terms of the, yeah. uh, with an index, right? If you are drawing it with an index, if we, instead of thinking of three scalar fields, phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, if we just think of this as phi i, right, as a general, which i, where i can take any value, right, 1, 2, or 3, then it's best to symmetrize it, right, then the Feynman diagrams can be drawn uh, directly without worrying about which field is what. Okay. So each scalar propagator will now represent either 1 or 2 or 3. Okay, you are summing over all of these. Yes. Is this okay? But it has to be three terms. Pardon? It is already symmetric and then mu and rho. So there are But see, according if you exchange mu and rho, okay, you also have to exchange k1 and k3. See, you have to exchange all the quantum numbers, right? In fact, you also have to exchange a and e. Okay. A and e exchange is okay because this is has already anti so A and E exchange, you can uh, just uh, use a minus sign. But if we exchange new row, it is true that this is symmetric in new row. Okay? But this is not symmetric under K1 K3 exchange. Is this clear? Okay, so that's, that's the reason why you have to actually add six terms. Okay, not uh, just three terms. So this one will replace, let's see what we replace it by. The body, if, if we had written it inside, okay, what you should strictly do is that I should write this FAD is multiplying this, okay, then symmetrize, write all six terms, okay, where all these indices are permuted, right? That's when you say that it's one, two, three, arbitrary permutation of one, two, three, right? That will mean that you have to exchange these, you have to exchange these as well as you have to exchange these. Okay? 
But all I'm saying is that exchanging these just cost the sign. We have to just keep track of the sign. Okay, otherwise you don't you will not have to worry. So this I can keep as a FAD as it is. I am not trying to take it inside. Okay, but we have to keep in mind that it sometimes you may pick a sign because if you are exchanging two, right, then this changes sign. Okay, and we'll uh, take that as background. So this I suggest to replace by this. The first term will be Italian Euro. Okay, let me write it in a slightly. It's I A1 U Italian Euro. Okay, plus permutation is what you have to add. So you have to basically pick all six permutations, all five permutations of this and add those five terms. Okay. So it's easiest to follow the following uh, 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 sequence, but you, you can choose any other sequence that you like. Okay. That if we use cyclic permutations first, right? One, two, three, there are three cyclic permutations. Two, three, one, and three, one, two. Okay. Under cyclic permutations, F doesn't change sign. Okay, F A D is the same as E P A D, F D E F. Okay. So for those, we add with this plus sign. Then we exchange one, right? That gives a minus sign. And then again, some more all cyclic permutations of that configuration. Okay, so that's the way we are going to do this sum. Okay, so first let's add the cyclic permutation. So I shift one on this side. Right? So K1 will go to K2, right? K2. Mu goes to what? It was K1 mu, right? Mu goes to rho. So K2 rho. Right? Then we have a eta mu rho. So mu eta mu rho. So here, it's a new goes to mu and rho goes to new, right? <coughs> so, eta mu new. Is this clear? Then we take plus i a3. Now, again, see, rho, rho goes to what under cyclic permutation? New. Rho goes to new. So, k3 new. Well, once this is new, you know that this has to be new. Right? Because we see in this way. <laughs> so, next you have to subtract. Right? Next ones are all with minus signs. So, first, let's do one thing. We keep say one fixed and exchange two and three. So K1 remains at K1, mu becomes rho. So minus I K1 rho and this has to be equal to mu. Now again, let's cyclically formulate these changes, right? So minus I K2, so rho is going to nu, so K2 nu, eta mu rho, minus I K3, now mu is going to mu, so K3 mu, So this is the vortex. Okay, we can write this in a somewhat, somewhat more symmetric fashion. For example, eta nu rho coefficient has i q1 nu minus k3 nu. Right? So similarly, each eta <coughs> coefficient you can select. Okay, maybe we'll do that when we write the vortex. So now let's write the vortex. So here is the vortex. So you have a nu. This is carrying 
A mu K1 is entering. So this is B mu K2 is entering. B mu K2 is entering. And this one, so this is E rho. So there's a minus, now you multiply by i, okay, that minus i, I just take all the i factors outside, so that those cancel, so I get 1 sixth g f a b g and then here i's are gone, so k1 mu minus k3 mu theta mu rho okay that takes care of these terms then theta mu nu okay i k2 rho minus k1 rho theta mu nu plus k2 rho Eta mu rho, so that k3 mu okay, so this is the triple gauge uh, coordinates. So next we have the port A. So A, B, B, B. So this comes from let's see with a minus one quarter. And then you have Okay, this is the structure. If you take the quadric term, which is coming from the quadratic term in F, multiplied by quadratic term in F, right? so now the minus one quarter remains as it is. Okay, and this is what you get. Okay, I get this is integral. Okay. So now you do whatever is you are supposed to do so you minus g square by 4 integral d4 k1 right, by 2 pi to the 4 up to d4 k4 by 2 pi to the 4 delta 4 
so we have eta mu rho, eta mu sigma, f <coughs> abc, f abc. So again, we have to symmetrize, right? To have an efficient part of you have to symmetrize. Okay. So the most naive thing that you can do is then multiply by one over twenty-four times all permutation. Replaced by 1 over 24 times sum of all permutation. That's 24 terms, right? But this time, not all are different. Okay, so we can do some simplification. So let's see what terms are equal. How many terms will be equal? Okay, that depends on the symmetry of this. Right? If already has, if it already has some symmetry, then you don't uh, have to symmetrize. So, what are the symmetries that it has? So, you two exchange one and three. 1, 3 exchange, let's see if it's manifested symmetry. Okay. I exchange 1 and 3. Okay. So that exchanges mu and rho. Okay. And then 1 and 3 exchange here exchanges B and D. Okay. That doesn't look so hopeful, right? Just 1 and 3 exchange, you start to keep this unchanged. So if you exchange one and three and two and four, right? Then it is okay. Right? So at least we can see that you can replace this by one over twelve times some over twelve terms. Okay, so I'll leave it in exercise two. Finally. So okay, the most the most brute force pro procedure will be is sum over all permutations and then collect terms. Right? So and some terms will be equal, obviously, by this uh, symmetry. You collect it and you write the sum of terms. Okay. So the general strategy should be clear, right? You write down the most general possibilities, sum over all permutations, and then you try to group them together, terms which are identical. Okay, that helps you get rid of some real So this vortex, then we have the following structures. It's a four vortex. So we have E mu K1. So this is E mu K1 entering. Then C mu E mu K2, E rho K3, and E sigma, and so you have minus i, okay, there is an extra factor of i, minus i, d square by 4, then you have some 1 over 12 times Okay, in that process, you can also see if we can discover some more symmetries and reduce the terms of order. Okay, this is left as an exercise. <coughs> Are there 
Multiply by i, yes. The minus sign is already there, right? So I multiply that by i because it's e to the is, right? That's the way to remember. The i came because it's e to the is, and that's what we are expanding it out, right? That's the factor of i. I wrote down, let me just see. I think I had an I and then there's a minus I by 6. But if I'm going to just check this. Yeah, because there's a overall, S had an overall minus sign, right? And that minus sign, that's why I'm trying this minus sign. But of course, half of them are plus, half of them are minus, right? Inside the bracket. So you could do it in another order, you may get overall minus. So there is one more vortex left, right? So what, which is that one? So there is a ghost ghost k vortex, right? Because we had a cubic coupling between two ghost fields and k. So let's look at that. So the interaction term was G F A B C integral B four X And because this acts on the B, you get I Q on B. Okay. So what kind of a vortex will this be? momenta entering k1 Yes, from C to B, yeah, that's in the propagator, but in the, on this line, is it upwards or downward? Downward. Downward. See, it emerges from B, right? That was the, it emerges from B. So which vortex, which line is B line here, in the vortex? This is a B line, right? So it should emerge from here. 
from the vortex. So you are not referring to the vortex, not this end. Right? So here it has to emerge from this vortex. So it's going to be like this. So the the factor will be I times B F A B C <laughs> times I K one B. This is overall I which comes in to be I S. Now, before I end, let me just discuss one puzzle here. Well, it's not really a puzzle, but it's a little confusing. So, let's look at the Feynman case. A simple gauge. Here we saw that if we have a mu of k1, a tilde mu of k2, this has this structure of minus b and b, minus minus i delta a b. And then that momentum conservation function. Okay. Now normally when we look for the spectrum of the theory, okay, what kind of particles it contains, we look at the poles. Right? The poles of the propagator represent physical points. Right? That's the general rule in uh, quantum field theories. So here, if you look at the pole of this propagator, you see that it's proportional to eta mu nu, which basically suggests that there are four physical particles for the field mu. Right? Because eta mu nu is the four by four matrix minus one 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 one. Right? So that suggests that there are four particles. Okay, one for each. Index. But of course, from our experience in QBD, we know that that's not the case. Right? The physical particles for a massless gauge particle, okay, as far as at the level of the propagator, there's really no difference between this and QBD. Right? You can just think of this as n square minus 1 copies of QBD if you are dealing with n SU and gauge theories. Okay? So from QBD, we know that for each of these gauge fields, you should really have two physical particles, right? not four. Another question is, how do you see that this actually contains two physical particles and not four? Okay, because Feynman gauge propagator seems to suggest that there are four. Right? If we just naively look at this, if somebody gave you this propagator okay, and asked you to find out the physical spectrum, you might conclude that there are four particles in the propagator. So to see how this comes about, we will first use a mathematical identity, which is a eta mu nu, you can show can be written in the following way. Okay. 
that gave you r level that's k0 and the special component k k bar mu the definition of k bar mu that it's like k mu but the zero component changes sign okay. it's minus k0 and k so let me see how i have defined it i think no i have defined it in slightly different way k0 minus k okay it also of course doesn't matter because if you look at the formula it's and the overall change of sign of k bar it seems like yeah. Uh, one of the no, no, I'm not using uh, everything is real. Okay. I'm not using any real, any complex epsilon. Right? You are thinking of probably circularly polarized. Yeah, uh, in general, if you write epsilon star, then when you take linear polarized, then those have become real. But I'm just uh, using linear basis. Right? So it's uh, just like this. Okay, what else? Oh, epsilon. So epsilon one and epsilon two, these satisfy. These are in fact of the following form: as zero epsilon one and zero epsilon two, which means that they don't have any time component. And furthermore, you have k dot epsilon one equal to zero, k dot epsilon two equal to zero. And epsilon order epsilon. Okay, you can in fact think of this in a Lorentz invariant term. This looks like it breaks. It's not fully Lorentz covariant, but I can also write this as k plus k bar dot epsilon one equal to zero k minus k bar. Epsilon, epsilon i, and epsilon i. So okay, these are entirely equivalent statements because one should demand this and this. Then this in turn implies that epsilon has zero comp uh, uh, the uh, time component of epsilon is zero, and the space component satisfies these relations. Now this is an identity. Okay, this is an identity, and one of the proof this identity is to go to a particular uh, rotational frame in which the k vector that is along the z-axis. Okay, suppose you go to a frame in which the k vector is along the z axis, in which case epsilon and epsilon 2 can be taken to be unit vectors along the 1 and 2 directions. Right? If k is along the z axis, okay, that you can always choose. Right? You can rotate your frame to make k, the, k along the z axis. Okay? Then epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 okay, you take to be along the 1 and 2 axis. Okay? They will automatically satisfy these relations over here. And of course, the zero component we are setting to zero by time. I should have written. I think this is this identity. There may be an ordered k square correction, but which you don't care about. Okay, in this case, probably there is no ordered k square correction. But I am thinking of this identity as an identity when k square is close to zero. Where k is either k one or k two. Okay, I'll not k is equal to k one. That's our idea. <coughs> okay. This, of course, still doesn't help in solving our problem okay. because this, in fact, makes it manifest that there are four different uh, polarizations because you have epsilon one, epsilon two, okay. and you also have k and k bar, right? And all of those in general properties. So what we are going to show now is that if we take the FF two-part function, then these contributions tap out. Okay, in the two-part function of F mu mu rho and F mu sigma, only these contributions. Okay. 
and that's what is physical because a a correlation function is not physical right we have already said that that's not a gauge invariant object okay. so when we say that the photon has two polarizations okay. what one exactly means in qed or in gauge theory when a gauge massless gauge particle has two polarization is that if we calculate the correlation function of gauge invariant operators okay, there you will find that the poles of the mm. propagator get contribution only from two polarization is this statement clear okay so let's just uh, verify that this is true okay so if f calculate the ff correlation function so you want yes yeah um, from here actually uh, the one part of the first term actually one can show that that is actually the coulomb interaction term and uh, okay and uh, means and the thing is that the full, when one calculate the s matrix actually from the uh, gauge invariant this first term actually do not contribute only the inception and exception term will contribute well yeah that is true in certain cases okay in simple cases but in a non abelian gauge theory right okay, you really have to sum over all of these so you cannot just if you just drop this first term from everywhere right okay, i don't think you will get the right answer right you have to because they also have to take into account the effect of the ghosts and so on, right? In QED, the identities are somewhat simple. Okay, but right now we are not even talking about calculating S matrix. Okay, we just want to see in the poles. Okay, that's if somebody has given us this action, that right, gauge fixed action, and told us what the gauge invariant operators are, okay, could we have calculated the spectrum? Okay, and the answer is yes, we could calculate the spectrum because if we had already the knowledge about what the gauge invariant operators are. Even though this theory has no gauge invariance, okay. then by uh, calculating the two uh, correlation function of the gauge invariant of particles and looking for poles in those correlation functions, we can figure out what the physical particles are. Okay. Because while these poles, okay, that this one over k one square gets contribution from all the four uh, polarizations for a a correlation function, okay. for a f correlation function they don't contribute. Is this yeah? okay. So if we calculate f tilde mu the mu say f tilde mu rho mu one f tilde mu sigma okay. and I should have said earlier also that this correlation function okay because you are only looking at the lowest order, you take the g goes to zero limit, right? You keep only the uh, uh, result for the g goes to zero limit because after, uh, if you are, take, want to calculate order g contributions, then you have to take into account various other order g contributions. Okay? So, at the order g to the zero limit, this is just k rho A mu zero, q one mu zero minus q one rho k mu times k two mu k sigma. proportional to an i square. Is this clear? I just replaced del mu arrow by i k mu arrow. Okay. That's why this i i square comes because there is a factor of i from here, and a factor of i from here. Okay. So k on mu a tilde rho minus k on rho a tilde mu, k2 mu a tilde sigma minus k2 sigma a tilde rho. A and b indexes. Pardon? A and B indexes, okay. A and B indexes, let's put A and B. B and B. Now K2 of course is minus K1. Okay, let's call this K. Or minus K. I'll call K1 as K. <laughs> So this 
is proportional to J mu. This I square cancels because one of the K2s is minus K. Okay, so that minus and I square gives you plus one. But I'm just looking at the uh, proportional part. Right? So K mu K nu. That's the part term. A rho A sigma. Theta rho sigma. Okay. Then we have to subtract the result of new new exchange. Sorry, mu rho exchange. Okay. So k rho k nu theta mu sigma. Pardon? Yeah, yeah. That's why the proportional constant is there. One over k square, of course, is there. So this is clear. I just combine this with this, and then this with this will give you minus. K nu K sigma theta rho nu plus K rho K sigma theta rho nu. Okay, this I squared with minus sign, etc. You should plus one, but that's not the relevant part. So now the idea is that for each of the zeta, we substitute what is here. Okay? And you have to show that this part cancels out for each of the zeta. This is this clear? And the way it cancels, you see, <coughs> you take the first term. Okay? Then you are anti-symmetrizing in mu rho as well as in mu sigma. Yeah, so just, just just look at the first term. Okay. First term gives you k mu k nu, and in eta rho sigma you have here k rho k bar sigma plus k sigma k bar rho. Over k dot k1. Okay, k dot k1 of course has no pole, right? This is a0 square plus k vector square. So k dot k1 has no pole. Okay. But now you see that there is k mu k rho. The first term, let's look at this k mu k rho, right? This is symmetric and mu and rho. Okay. So once you anti symmetrize in mu and rho, which is what you are supposed to do here, this term will vanish. k mu k rho part. Is that clear? Second term has a k nu k sigma. So once you anti symmetrize in nu sigma, okay, which is because of this term over here, that will also vanish. So this way you can show that when you, in fact, I mean, this is just a qualitative way to see it, but if you substitute this here and expand it out, you will find that all the terms cancel pairwise. Okay, but the physical reason is simply this. That you either have k mu k rho, okay. which is anti symmetric in mu rho, okay. or you have k nu k sigma, which is symmetric in nu sigma, okay, and hence anti symmetrization makes it vanish. Okay. So, this way you can convince yourself that while in the AA correlation function, okay. all four polarizations are contributing, okay. if you take f mu nu f rho sigma, or in this case I have taken by f mu rho f mu sigma correlation function. You still have, of course, mu and mu run over all four indices, right? So, in fact, here you have more correlation function, six, because mu rho together can take six values. Okay? This can also take six values. Okay? So, there are 36 possible uh, term combinations you can take here. Right? As opposed to 16 possible combinations in the mu, a new correlation function. Nevertheless, a mu and correlation function depends on more data than f mu nu f rho sigma correlation function. Okay, because that gets contribution from all polarizations, whereas 
SF correlation function gets contribution only from the epsilon. <coughs> Pardon? Exactly. So the AA correlation function depends on the choice of gauge. Okay. But as I uh, discussed earlier, okay, the FF correlation function doesn't depend on the choice of gauge. Right? So here, for example, if you change alpha, if you instead of taking the final propagator, suppose you have taken another propagator, right? Which will have an additional term proportion to K mu K nu over K square. Okay. But you can show that those terms all uh, uh, do not contribute to the FF correlation function. Okay, so the only terms that contribute to the FF correlation function are these and their contribution is universal, independent of the choice of gauge. Sir, so this fact is not Will not? Like the XNIP, when you get the FF correlation function, will not contain alpha. Yes. That's right. So that is not sufficient to Yeah, so if you are willing to do a little more work, instead of using eta mu nu, right? If you also use eta mu nu plus that extra term, okay? And then take that extra term and then repeat this analysis, okay? Then you can show that those extra terms also do not contain. Is that, yes, so that's another way of saying that the extra terms will not contribute. So the general lesson is that to get a um, idea of what the physical spectrum is, okay. you really should look at the two-point function of gauge invariant operators. Okay. That will tell you, if you look for the poles of the two-point function, that as in a normal quantum field theory. Okay. But by looking at two-point function of gauge invariant operators, you are guaranteed that whatever poles you are finding actually correspond to physical states. Okay, whereas if you use gauge non invariant of parts, you will get spurious poles. Okay. For example, the ghost goes two point function, right? That also has a pole. There is a one over k squared sitting there. Right? The ghosts are apparently massless particles. Okay. But those are not gauge invariant, right? That's why those poles don't bother us because you don't see them in physical correlation. Yeah, but they're necessary because you have to let them run in the loop. Okay, without those, you will not get a, get a gauge invariant correlation function at the end. Okay. So this procedure can be applied even while calculating the corrections to the masses of various particles. Right? You look at the gauge invariant correlation function. I mean, here I should have also added that what I have done here is a little bit of cheating because this is still not gauge invariant in a non abelian case. Okay. Yeah. Only the g goes to zero limit, this is gauge invariant. Okay. So what I have done here is the g goes to zero limit of an analysis, okay. in which case you can uh, take this to be gauge invariant quantities. Right? Because the gauge transformation of mu had one term which is del mu epsilon, okay, under which f is invariant, but there is also this g term proportional to g. Okay. That uh, makes it, uh, that under that transformation is not gauge invariant. Right, it is gauge covariant. So this is the analysis that g goes to zero limit. For QED this is true. Pardon? For QED this is true, yes. Because for QED there is no other term, right? For QED this is generally gauge invariant. Okay. 